You know, I'll never forget that bitter cold, raw October morning. I was 17 years old and riding my single speed bicycle to high school on Bainbridge Island as fast as I could. The sun was just peeking up over the hill in front of me, but the wind was blowing right through my fleece coat. Now, by the time I got to high school, and some of you who are cyclists know how this feels, my hands were frozen. It was to the point where I couldn't just take them off the handlebars. I actually kind of had to squeegee them off. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I opened up the door, I walked down the hallway of the high school, and I turned to my right, and I said, good morning, Jenny from the office. And she says, good morning, Mark. And I said, you know, it's just about time I get one of those parking spaces. It's getting really cold out there. And she looks at my frozen hands, and she agrees. So she takes this yellow piece of paper out from behind her desk, slaps it down on top of the desk, slides it towards me, and I pick it up. My jaw drops, because there at the top of the page, in bold italic number 27, it reads, this year, parking at Bainbridge High School is $240. And I said, Ginny, this is crazy. You know, this is not Seattle waterfront parking. This is high school. And she looks at me and she says, well, you know, Mark, this year we want people to carpool. We want people to be more green, you see? And it was in this moment a light bulb just kind of popped up on top of my head. And so I said, okay. And I turned and I walked away. That night, though, I was like Michelangelo all over a pile of papers. I was scratching, scribbling, writing, tearing, throwing. You know, and then I had my idea. I threw it up. And the next day I had such a pep in my step, I open up the door, I walk down the hallway of high school, I turn to my right, I say, good morning, Jenny. And she goes, whoa, good morning. I said, you know, I have an idea. I have a proposal. So I take my idea, slap it down on top of the desk, slide it towards her, and she picks it up and looks at it and looks at me. And I said, what do you think? What do you think? If I build an electric car, if I'm more green than anyone in the high school, can I have a free parking space? And she kind of thinks about it for a moment. She scratches her chin like this. And she says, uh, yeah, actually, yeah, I think we can do that for you. And ladies and gentlemen, nine months and $2,900 later, <laughs> I had myself a free $240 parking space. You know, and whenever I tell that to people, I can always see they're doing the math in their head and they're, Hold on a second, Mark. It sounds like you took one step forward and 12 steps back. And you know, I agree. It sounds crazy to some. But to some, it sounds amazing, like an opportunity to grow and to learn through non-traditional methods to invent and to be the change that you wish to see. And that's the part of you that I'm really talking to tonight. Because you see, this electric car project, taught me three lessons that changed my entire life. And so tonight, I want to share those three lessons. I also want to share a little bit about the process of how I built my electric car. Now, when I got started, I got so excited. And in my research, I found that there are a few ways about getting to this goal of your electric car. Now, one of the first ways is to go to a junkyard to take the engine out of an old junkie car to replace it with an electric motor. The electric motor actually takes the place of the engine. And then there's another way of getting this goal of your electric car, and think kit car, where you weld up the frame, you bolt the wheels to the, to the frame, and you mold the body to the way that you see fit. And in my mind, this was exactly the way that I had wanted to approach this project, because I wanted this car to look exactly the way that I had imagined it. And so I started by welding up the frame. And I got some old car motorcycle tires, and I fastened the frame, as best as I could, I made this kind of quick and dirty steering mechanism because I didn't want to wait to test it. <laughs> I took it down my neighbor's driveway a couple of times, and I must have gone three miles an hour. It just was not eventful. And so I called my friend Jackie over, and I said, Jackie, you know, and, and uh, she and I got really excited about using this car frame to its full potential. So we found the biggest hill around we could, <laughs> Dingley Hill. Now at 475 feet long and a 23 degree grade, this hill was prime for testing a 240 pound electric car frame. And we made sure, I, mean, you know, I made sure that everything was very safe. 
I was going to steer the frame with my dad's rusty vice grips. <laughs> Jackie and I were sitting on a cardboard box balanced between two metal bars, and I even went through the effort of handing her a two-foot chunk of wood. I said, Jackie, listen, if we get out of control, push this against the ground, and we'll slow down. <laughs> she, she goes, oh, okay. <laughs> and so as I'm up there at the top of this hill, looking down at this never-ending concrete roller coaster of death, I realized in this moment, and through hindsight, my first life lesson. And that is that fear is an opportunity to have less of it. Now, when I face a fear in life, I literally have two options. I can either hunch back, hunker down, fade away, run away, or I can take a deep breath, take a step, and face the fear. And in this moment where I faced either falling back and giving up because of fear or pushing forward and rolling down that hill, I realized that if I didn't go for it, then I was, in a sense, giving up the goal of having my electric car. Because you see, when I started this project, I did not know how to, how to weld. I didn't know how to lay fiberglass or how to machine. I didn't know how to build cars. I knew none of that. But I did know one thing up there at the top of that hill. I knew that if I were the type of person who could face a fear of rolling down a 475-foot hill, then I was certainly the kind of person who could face the fear of getting my butt off the couch, into the garage, to begin to learn to weld, to learn to machine, to lay fiberglass, and to build a car that never existed. You see, I think that facing fear is like a muscle. It grows with use, with practice. And the way that this translates into my current life is, you know, I have all these lofty goals and these things I really want to achieve, you know, and what I learned up there at the top of that hill is that all I really need to do is to just take a breath, take a step, and face the fear. And the moment that I do that, I'm literally opening myself up to beginning to construct, to strengthen, build a muscle that is designed for pushing the remaining fears out of the way. Fear right in front of you, right in the moment, is an opportunity to overcome it and to have less fear tomorrow morning. And so with that, Jackie and I lifted our feet and we began to roll. And let me tell you, everything was beautiful. The wind was blowing through our hair. Sun was shining on our face. I felt like Fabio. <laughs> you know, everything was great until we hit about 27 miles an hour. My dad's rusty vice grips slipped. With all the strength I had, I couldn't keep the car frame from steering left. And Jackie and I started screaming as we're bombing down the hill. The wheels are vibrating violently a bump and then a jolt and once more to the left, and we scream into a ditch, up and out of the ditch, up into a neighbor's rock wall, knocking rocks off as we went, and then we slammed headfirst into a concrete light post. The whole front of the car caved in, and the front wheels snapped off. Hanging by a thread of metal, the struts snapped, and they shot oil up and into the air. And then there was this moment of complete silence. And understandably, I thought we were dead. And then I heard this kind of slowly increasing crying from behind me. And I turned around very slowly, and I saw Jackie. Although to my surprise, she wasn't crying out of pain. She was actually crying out of, like, uncontrollable laughter. And so <laughs> we stood up, and we started this outburst. And we're like, that was so awesome! <laughs> High five! Weedy, weedy, weedy! You know, we're so excited in this moment. You know, we're looking down at the carcass of my car frame. I'm distraught by the death of it, by invigorated by the ride of my life. In this moment and through hindsight, I realized my second life lesson. And that is that failure gives depth to my success. I know this might sound a little bit confusing at first, and so I'm going to do my best to explain it by telling you a side story. So imagine with me right now that tomorrow morning, you wake up out of a coma, and you know nothing. You don't know who you are, where you've been, what you've done. You know nothing up to this point. 
you are in a sense at a ground zero neutral state. Things are neither good nor bad, they just are. Now imagine with me that uh, you take a taxi home and as you're pulling into your driveway, to your utter surprise, you live in a mansion. You're a multi-millionaire. Sure enough, you go and you open up your giant wooden doors to reveal a glass chandelier right above you, a white marble tile floors below you, and a personal butler right in front of you to your every beck and call. I think it's pretty safe to say you are feeling good right now. But here's the thing. The only reason why you're feeling good is because you are heightened above your previous ground zero neutral state. But let me ask you something. How do I truly know what a success, what a victory feels like if I don't have the failure and hardship to reference it off of? You know, I think that failure gives depth to success. And I don't think that success knows how high you are until you simultaneously know how low you've been. And you know, I have failed so many times in my life in working towards my goals. But through it all, it's my personal opinion that nothing worth being proud of was ever earned easily. And so with that, I put the necessary amount of time and planning into building the new car frame. On, uh, on one side of the garage, I had the new car frame. On the other side of the garage, I had the body of the car that I was building out of foam and fiberglass. And on more than one occasion, my mother, she'd walk into the garage and she'd, she'd put her hands on her hips like this and she'd say, Mark, where are my kitchen knives? <laughs> you know, I'd like walk back and hand them back to her with big old chunks of foam and glue all over them. You know, so, I was working on the body in the car, but eventually I completed the car. I was finished with it, except for one last part. I needed to finish the electrical components of the car. And in an attempt to not electrocute myself, I went on a search for somebody that actually knew what they were doing, and I found someone. And his name was Charlie. And Charlie taught me more about electric cars than I could have ever asked for. I looked up to him. And I found that he wanted to see that I didn't just succeed in this car project, but he wanted to see that I succeeded in life. And with that, I learned my third life lesson. And that is the incredible impact that a mentor can have on a young person. And you know, I find it so interesting to notice in these moments of decisions as I'm growing older, these real tough life decisions. I'm not asking myself, what would I do in this situation? What I'm actually asking myself is, what would Charlie do in this situation? What would Brad do in this situation? And what would Paul do in this particular situ situation? I am, in a sense, literally guided to be like my mentors, to be like my heroes. And to be honest, I would wish that on any young person who, like me, was struggling to find my identity, my self-control, my purpose here on this earth. And if there was any one piece of advice that I could give to you or to any young person that you may know, it would be to take on a project to live life passionately, to define an enormous goal in your mind's eye and to work every day to relentlessly achieve it. Thank you.